I was nearly 40 when I understood what it meant for me to be trans. I and others in my family while I was growing up had known or suspected, at least, for many years. But there's a difference between knowing and understanding, rather like the difference between GCSEs and A-levels. GCSEs test what you know, while A-levels should test what you understand. To mangle an oft-quoted example, knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit, which is often used in salads. However, if you understand what a tomato is, you won't use it in a fruit salad. And I say that because it shows that even if you know something or are something, it can quite take quite some length of time before you understand it, or at least understand that it applies to you. We often need help to gain that understanding. The last 20 years seems to have seen an explosion in the number of trans people we see around us, and probably even more so in the last five years. Part of that is down to trans people's growing confidence as society and government policies and law have become more accepting of us. But part is because more people now have the information that they need to understand that trans might, just might, apply to them. We're still talking about a very small percentage of people. The information comes from a variety of sources, some from personal contact, but most of it falls under the umbrella term of media. Of course, 20 years ago, we didn't have social media. Facebook, Twitter, and so on. There were some rudimentary internet forums, but there wasn't the mass sharing of information, correct or otherwise, that we see now. And it's meant that up until fairly recently, we relied on traditional media, newspapers, radio, television, to help us understand the world. Up until around 1970, press coverage of trans people was factual, straight-laced. Reporting of the, was of the style, this very strange thing has happened, a bit dry, but no real judgment. Readers were left to draw their own conclusions. Authorities coped, often quietly and without fuss. And then two things happened. Despite expert legal and medical advice, socialite April Ashley had her marriage to an heir to the Guinness fortune annulled. The judicial ruling was... If you're born male, you must always be legally male. After a tortuous court case, Ashley didn't have the energy to appeal, and so legal precedent was set. She ran off to France. And interestingly enough, a month later, a French court allowed a trans woman to marry a man on the grounds that she was obviously female. The Ashley decision in the UK removed access of trans people to administrative procedures that we had used for many years. And so it began a long process of legal challenges, usually by trans women wanting to marry the man of their dreams. A couple of years later, in 1972, Jan Morris, who had been the press reporter on Sir Edmund Hillary's successful team who conquered Everest in 1953. Jan was intrusively grilled about her transition on national television. The media narrative, up until this point factual, had started to change. The occasional court victory, and they were initially very few indeed, was reported again largely factually. However, during the 80s and 90s, trans people became subjects of fascination. 
Starting with 1979's George to Julia, also called A Change of Sex, a BBC series which followed a trans woman from the very early stages of explaining herself and her decision to her family all the way through to the operating theatre and ending with Channel 4's Eurotrash, where trans people were positioned of one of a panoply of weird, exotic, sexualized people. The media coverage transformed into what I would call zoo television. A David Attenborough narration wouldn't have been out of place in large parts of it. It felt a bit trapped behind glass. The better programs focused on the medical and surgical narrative. The stereotype of the burly bricklayer going into surgery and emerging as some kind of glamazon was born, the butterfly effect. Reality is mostly far less prosaic. And zoo television continues to this day. Right now, this week, ITV is broadcasting a series called Transformation Street. The repeated focus on surgeries as if those are all that defines a trans person, causes increasing outrage within trans communities, yet broadcasters still do it. Press coverage was also mutating. It was becoming more hostile. And by the time the Leveson inquiry was called in 2012, sufficient evidence had been mustered that suggested press coverage fell into three broad categories. That trans people are fraudulent, that trans people are undeserving, and that trans people are deviant. All of these meant that trans people were entitled to be ridiculed. We were a paradox. Despite there being so many of us that we were unnecessarily hoovering up vast amounts of scarce NHS resources, there were also so few of us that why was the NHS bothering to treat us at all? Now, in 2012, Channel 4 broadcast a series called My Transsexual Summer. Despite the awful title, this series was genuinely different from anything that had gone before, as it followed trans people's lived stories. And while the first of the four programmes did the surgery thing, the other three looked at the very real difficulties trans people had in getting jobs or housing, and also how their close families dealt with transition. That series and the shift in coverage that it promised probably wouldn't have been like it was without the input of a group called Trans Media Watch. Rewinding a few years, 2009, ITV broadcast an episode of a comedy called Moving Wallpaper, which featured a trans character. And it became very quickly clear that this character only existed to be the target of comedy. In the 27-minute programme, there was a transphobic joke every 90 seconds. Ofcom received numerous complaints, well into the hundreds, and they dismissed them all. A number of us, about 40 of us, then appealed, and Ofcom dismissed the appeal. So, we appealed again. And this time, Ofcom decided to invite some of us in on the understanding that we stopped appealing. They recognised they didn't actually understand the problem that we were explaining. So five of us, including me, sat with some senior Ofcom managers and complaints handlers and discussed what being trans meant, what societal pressures we faced the types of media coverage and the effect it had on us. And we started that meeting with a three-minute montage of hateful coverage which had been broadcast over the previous 12 months. It had a massive effect as Ofcom introduced us 
to a couple of other very key people in broadcasting. And Transmedia Watch was born. And two years later, I was sitting in the blue chair giving ev the charity's evidence to the Leveson Inquiry, detailing the abuses the British press were visiting on trans people and their families. The other thing which very quickly became clear, not just at Ofcom, but at Channel 4, the BBC, the Press Complaints Commission, and many other media organisations, was that media coverage was not generally driven by malice, but by ignorance. Our mission was to encourage the British media to report trans issues with accuracy, dignity and respect. But that meant encouraging time-pressured journalists and editors to invest time thinking and learning about our issues. So although we started in protest, we quickly became a group who engaged to educate. And it also meant that we had to learn quickly about media. I'm an IT person. I knew hardly anything about media in 2009. And now I know only too well the pressures on journalists, editorial structures, how good press releases are structured, complaints processes, and so on. Others can judge whether I actually understand any of that. However, recently there are some people, those in the media and those with access to the media, who do now intend to set the clock back. We see that very clearly now where parts of the press have learnt how to bypass the editor's code to make sure they can publish hateful transphobic pieces without coming under official censure. Where possible, they now write about trans people as a generic group rather than naming any specific individual. They cite spurious surveys to support stories. They scream, Free speech every time they are challenged, which is a gross misrepresentation of what free speech actually is. So the national media coverage has changed, as has the national conversation around trans people. And I've had a part to play in that. That media narrative is continuing to change. And the battle is to ensure that trans people can continue to influence that process. So, what made Transmedia Watch effective? And this is the bit that I hope can apply to everybody. I always like to give people something to take away with them. At our heart was a core team of five volunteers, all of whom were dedicated, passionate, and driven to make change. Research does seem to show that five is a very good number as it coalesces well and it enables people to make decisions effectively. Beyond five, you get too many possible combinations of interactions to communicate effectively. With five people, it is very rare that three or more of you have no energy left. So there's always energy in the group to drive itself forwards. And interestingly for me, it was the second time I'd been in a core group of five volunteers and the second time I'd seen the same kind of effects. We also had a variety of skills. Only one of us was a media professional at the start, although another became a fairly well-known trans celebrity or personality. All five of us were university educated, but more importantly, all five of us contributed ideas and all five of us saw a common purpose in educating the media. So that my conclusion is that five people with a common passion can change our environment. Obviously, you need more than five to carry out everything, but a core of five is incredibly powerful. And I'd like to end by dedicating this particular talk to my mother-in-law. 
Kathy was someone who also knew the difference between knowing and understanding, the importance of doing your bit for a society and engaging and educating. And we said goodbye to her on Wednesday. Thank you.